Longtime advocate and flag bearer for the women's rights movement, Elizabeth Cady Stanton is joined by the 26th President of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt, to share thoughts and stories from the time when Americans struggled with this issue. Both of our guests will be happy to entertain any questions you have at the end. To start out, why don't each of you give a little bit of background about your early life? Ms. Stanton, would you start? Yes, I I was born in Johnstown, New York in 1815 into a Calvinist household where the first rule of life was the everlasting no. It seemed as though everything I ever wanted to do was forbidden to me. And one of the things that was an early influence on my life was my older brother, Eliezer, who was the apple of my father's eye the darling of my family. And he was the only son in my family who survived. He went to college, and he came home, and he died, leaving only us girls. And when I climbed up on my father's lap as he sat there in that darkened room, racked with grief, and I laid my head against my father's broken heart, my father put his arms around me and said, oh, my daughter, if only you had been a boy. And I said, I will be everything to you that my brother would have been. And I spent the rest of my childhood, indeed the rest of my life, trying to prove to my father that I was everything that my brother was and everything that a man could be. I would be intelligent and brave. I would be a citizen of these United States, which my father so loved. And when I married an abolitionist, displeasing father greatly, by the way, I learned that there were people in this country who suffered more than even I had suffered as that little girl in Johnstown, New York. And I would have it so that my daughters and all of our daughters and sons would never look into a parent's eyes and have that parent look back with anything less than the knowledge that we are equals and that we cannot be equal in this country. Not one of us is free until all of us is free. Now between 1815 and my death in 1902, and having died, I stand transcendent of time and completely capable of answering all of your questions, even the important ones. <laughs> between that time was a life lived in opposition to the everlasting no. And part of that story takes place here in Waterloo and in neighboring Seneca Falls, where a small group of us gathered together to talk about the grave injustices that were a part of the American tradition that lasted all of those years between the Declaration of Independence and 1848 when we penned the Declaration of Sentiments here in this house. 72 years before we had the courage to stand up and say that we the people must include the women. And it would be another 72 years before we achieved the right to vote. And mind you that only some of us because African women, African American women were left out of that promise. And between those years were years I spent traveling, telling people about the need for equality, the desire of my heart, not just for suffrage, because suffrage was merely the tool, but for an uncompromising justice. A tenderness toward each other as citizens, as persons that we look each other in the eye and see an equal looking back at us and treat them with the dignity that all human beings deserve. Now, I could talk to you about my life for hours and hours, and I will indeed do that. So I will turn my time over to our president and let him tell you about his life. And then I strongly encourage you to ask us questions. And don't just ask us questions that are deeply theoretical or appropriately political. Ask us questions also about our lives and our motivations and the fears and joys we held as American citizens. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stanton. I am delighted to be here in Waterloo, New York, this most wonderful and gracious of days. I am a politician, and as such, when I start to speak, 
who knows when I shall end. But to honor the kind words of Mrs. Stanton, I shall be brief at this time, and then uh, hopefully we can share a few stories and thoughts and answer any questions you have. For I hope you will have questions. We are in the presence of very historic and iconic ladies. Not only do we have Mrs. Stanton here today, we have Miss Claire Barton over here, who in herself deserves uh, far more credit than probably she is given at times. Uh, uh, she's a favorite of the Rough Riders, you must know that. So anyone who's a favorite of the Rough Riders gets special attention and treatment. However, to give you a brief bio, when Mrs. Stanton was a mature adult woman uh, uh, with family issues and situations of her own, not only with the uh, uh, suffragette movement, I was born. I was born in 1858 in New York City, the greatest city on this continent, in this hemisphere. I loved every minute of growing up in New York City uh, by, uh, under the tutelage of two of the best parents a boy could ever have. My mother had her influence, as I'm sure uh, you would expect. Uh, a true southern Georgia belle would come north to live with her husband and raise her family uh, prior to the Civil War and, and during that war. My life has been surrounded by good and important. Now, it is true that I came to appreciate and support women's suffrage later in life. I was never an ardent supporter. I was a supporter of women's rights. In college, I wrote papers on the necessity, on the, on the rightness, the correctness of women being on an equal basis with men. Indeed, I, I uh, promoted the idea that women did not uh, or should not be forced to take their husband's name on marriage and they want to keep that faith name, that was, that's perfectly fine. But I was never an ardent firebrand of the movement, uh, at least uh, early on and early on in my political career. And this was in spite of the fact that I was always influenced by ladies. The ladies in the Roosevelt family are very special women indeed. Uh, my, my grandmothers, uh, Martha Stewart Bullock and Margaret Barnhill Roosevelt, uh, uh, the one filled us with the sense of adventure. We're seeing what's around the bend, what's over the hill. See how green that grass is next door. Uh, and then the other filled us with a sense of duty. And I tell you what, ladies, and I'm sure that you will all agree, at least in the Roosevelt family, the grandmothers ruled the roost. They, uh, you know, when the Roosevelts got together, there was one person in charge. My grandfather was not that person. <laughs> uh, uh, grandmother Roosevelt was, and, and uh, she's vital in all our lives. And of course, the, uh, my mother, Martha Stewart Bullock, and her sister, Hannah Bullock, uh, taught us, raised us. Uh, we were homeschooled, what you would say. Uh, their influence was incalculable. Uh, <laughs> There was my sister Anna, older sister Anna and younger sister Corrine, both Trumps, aces if there ever was one. In fact, Anna has always been said to be the smartest of all the Roosevelts. If Anna had been born a man, she would have been the first president named Roosevelt. But she was not. And her <laughs> advice and help and inspiration was magnificent throughout my life. My wife, Edith, the finest first lady we ever had, uh, an advisor, first of all, she's the one, when I made the unfortunate comment about uh, not running again, you know, I'd just been elected by a huge margin in 1905, and I said that would be my second term and I didn't intend to run again, it was Edith who was the first one to realize I had made a fatal <laughs> political air by saying it. Uh, then there's uh, my older daughter, Alice, who's, uh, she's worth a book by herself. Alice, in fact, I don't think Alice was the type of person to wait for women's suffrage to come along. She was already out front galloping as fast as she could to live her life as she wanted to and not as somebody told her. Uh, 
Then my daughter Ethel, who is, uh, well, she and her, her husband, Dr. Derby, were the first Roosevelt's overseas in the combat zone during World War I. She was, and all four of the boys would serve, but Ethel was the first over there. Uh, and then, of course, my niece, Eleanor, who, if Franklin has any sense at all, he'll pay attention to what Eleanor uh, suggests to him or, or tells him. So the women in the Roosevelt life have always been strong influence upon me. And as we talk and share a few stories, uh, hopefully I can give you some more of their opinion on how I gradually came from being a lukewarm supporter of women's suffrage to a progressive supporter of women's suffrage.